And welcome to our Homestead series, um, web series that we have here for Facebook Live and Instagram. I'm Dr. Greg Sanchez, the owner of Homestead uh, Franchises in Pasadena and Monrovia, California. And I wanna welcome you to this conversation that we are going to have about Alzheimer's and dementia. And it's uh, appropriate timing because we are getting ready to go ahead and kick off our Alzheimer's and Dementia Awareness Month with lots going on with the Alzheimer's Association, including our own uh, San Gabriel Valley Alzheimer's, Walk to End Alzheimer's. Um, so lots going on. And I am so pleased and honored to introduce you to uh, our very special guest speaker, Dr. Lakeland Hogan. Hogan, excuse me. <laughs> Dr. Hogan is a gerontologist and a caregiver advocate at the global headquarters of Home Instead. Uh, Lakeland works to educate professionals, families, and communities on issues of older adults face. And she has a special passion for family, helping families navigate the challenges of dementia caregiving and connecting them with valuable resources. Lakeland has earned her PhD in gerontology from the University of Nebraska in Omaha and is a certified dementia practitioner. I'd like to welcome Lakeland who has just been instrumental in helping Home Instead really go ahead and educate and advocate for our individuals who have cognitive impairment. And so thank you Lakeland so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to be here and to talk about something I am so passionate about. So uh, grateful for the opportunity. Excellent. So Lakeland, I think what we're going to, from a format perspective, what we're going to do is you're going to provide us with a, little, with a small presentation on um, Alzheimer's and dementia. And then subsequently, we can go ahead and have kind of a QA. and I'll be reading some of the uh, questions that have come through the chat. And it'll be kind of like a little coffee talk afterwards. Sounds great. Excellent. So I'll right. kick it over to you. Great. I will share my slides here. Hopefully I'm successful in doing so. Great. Can you see them on your end? I certainly can. Fantastic. Well, uh, again, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I thought that I would share today some tips for Alzheimer's and dementia care. I love that you're kicking off your uh, Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Uh, with a chat like this, and I am our national team coordinator of the Walk to End Alzheimer's for our Home Instead Network and the local team captain here in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, we actually have one of our big fundraisers this week, our silent auction. Uh, so I just, I love that you guys are so passionate about this cause, and, and I too am very passionate. One of the reasons being because there are over 6 million people living with Alzheimer's disease in the United States, and over 16 million people providing care and support, family caregivers. Uh, and so often when we're trying to support someone living with dementia, it can be challenging because of the changes that are happening in the brain. And you'll hear the term Alzheimer's and dementia, and you might be thinking, you know, are they the same thing? It's kind of confusing and you're not alone. Uh, it can be very confusing. So I thought I would start with just kind of overviewing the dementia basics. So Dementia is a decline in mental ability that's severe enough to impact daily life. Many people think that, uh, you know, mental decline is a normal part of aging, and it's not. You know, it's, it's normal to forget on occasion, you know, where you left your keys uh, or forget someone's name, but eventually we can retrace our steps back to find our keys, or in the middle of the night, we shoot out of bed and say, Sally, her name was Sally. Uh, and so we eventually remember these types of things, but someone living with dementia may not be able to retrace those steps. And so when, when the cognitive impairment is severe enough to impact daily life, then it is considered dementia, but again, not a normal part of aging. And there are different types of dementia. There's actually over a hundred different types of, of dementia or symptoms that cause dementia. Uh, so it can be confusing. So I like to envision it as an umbrella so dementia is an umbrella term. And then there are different types of dementia that fall underneath. So on the slide here, I have some of the most common types of dementia that you might hear or you might be experiencing. Alzheimer's disease is the number one uh, type of dementia. We see it most frequently. And then we also have vascular dementia. Often that is caused by a stroke or a lack of blood to the brain. 
Uh, Lewy body dementia is another type of dementia. Often we see that uh, in kind of um, happening in uh, in uh, the same vein as, as Parkinson's disease. So someone might have Parkinson's, but they might also have Lewy body dementia. Someone with that type of dementia might have a lot of hallucinations and delusions. They might have the tremor that you see in a Parkinson's disease. So sometimes uh, you'll hear it called Parkinson's dementia or Parkinson's related Lewy body dementia, but uh, that is one type. And then frontal temporal dementia affects kind of that frontal lobe of the brain that is really in charge of our, our reasoning, our judgment, our decision making. Uh, and so sometimes people with frontal temporal dementia, you'll see them start to make poor decisions. Often first it comes in the category of their finances uh, and then uh, it can and bleed over into other areas of their lives. But those are generally the most common types of dementia that you might see or experience with your loved one. And I'll, I'll probably focus more so on Alzheimer's just because it is the most common form of dementia, but know that there are those other types of dementia and they each kind of have uh, a, a nuance to them that makes them unique. So the most common symptoms that we see uh, for uh, beginning signs of Alzheimer's disease are that memory loss that disrupts daily life. You might see your loved one having sticky notes throughout the home, kind of reminding them of things. Uh, that memory loss, again, is, is disrupting their daily routine. You might also have them or see them have difficulty with completing those familiar tasks. You know, if they always cooked their signature apple pie, uh, and, and all of a sudden it's starting to taste a little off. You know, for, for years they could, they could make that pie from memory. And uh, now they're having trouble really doing that task uh, because of the cognition issues that they're having. You might also see them have challenges with planning and problem solving, something that they might have been able to kind of think through on their own, and they might not be able to do that anymore. Also confusion with time and place. If you've seen the movie Still Alice, there's this kind of haunting scene in the movie where she's on a run on the same path she's ran day after day for years. But all of a sudden, because of her cognitive decline, she is in an unfamiliar surrounding. Uh, even though she's been there many, many times, she doesn't know where she is. And it's very, very traumatizing for her and rightly so. So you might see that as a symptom. Also trouble understanding visual images and spatial relations. Uh, you start to notice your loved one is kind of tripping or um, have bumping into things. Uh, that might be because the part of the brain that, that's impacted by dementia could be the part that helps us you know, with our depth perception, uh, help us see when we're going from tile to carpet or when there's a step up or to see um, that there's a difference between the tan wall and the tan couch. Uh, they might start to have issues. Or something that I've noticed recently in an individual is uh, we were in a, a ballroom and there was a pattern on the carpet. There was also kind of a slope uh, that the person was walking on and uh, she became very uh, uneasy and needed someone to steady her as she walked in that, in that environment. So those are the things you might start to see happening in your loved one. Some other... Um, uh, common symptoms are misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace steps. I used the keys example just a moment ago. Also that decreased or poor judgment. Maybe they are selling off assets that, that they shouldn't be, or um, they're giving to all of the charities that send them a piece of mail. Uh, that's something that could be a sign that there's something going on cognitively that needs to be addressed. Uh, someone's withdrawing from work or social activities, it might be because they're starting to notice changes in their cognition. And um, so rather than uh, admitting it to someone, they might just withdraw from situations where people might start to notice those cognitive impairments. Mm -hmm. Also changes in their mood or personality. You know, if your loved one all of a sudden is starting to um, kind of lash out or um, is a little more... Um, agitated or, um, you know, just the, the mood uh, that, that has been their norm forever has all of a sudden changed. It could be that there's something, uh, some sort of cognitive issue happening for that individual. And then also problems with speaking and writing. You might see that uh, it's more challenging for them. They're, they're having trouble recalling certain words. Uh, they might use every other word to describe this pen right here. And they might say, oh, that thing that you write with, uh, 
and and so they might be having issues recalling uh, certain items. And so what's really important is if you're seeing a pattern in your loved one uh, of these types of um, symptoms, they need to get to a medical professional for evaluation uh, because it could be that there's an underlying condition. Uh, also, if you see some of these symptoms come on uh, very suddenly, it could be related to something like a UTI, a urinary tract infection. So you need to get to the doctor to, to really get to the root of what is happening. It could be a vitamin deficiency, it could be a UTI, or it could be some sort of dementia or cognitive impairment. Uh, and some people say, well, what's the point in getting a diagnosis because well, there's nothing that they can do. There's no cure for this disease. And, and while that's true that there's no cure, there is a lot that we can do to support somebody and to support their family. Uh, the person can do some advanced planning. They can kind of take control of the situation and say, this is what I want as I progress through the disease. There's a lot of important decisions that need to be made. And families sometimes wait too long to the point where the person can no longer make those decisions for themselves. So again, there's, there is benefit to that early diagnosis and detection. Uh, and one is you can also become an advocate, you can join a clinical trial, and you can help uh, advance the research and science and advocacy in this space. But as someone progresses through uh, Alzheimer's disease, you'll, you'll kind of see it in three phases. You have kind of the early stages of dementia where you start to see those symptoms. In the middle stage of dementia, you'll start to see that they need more assistance with things like activities of daily living, bathing, grooming themselves. And then there's the late stage of dementia where really they're declining to the point where they might not be able to communicate. They might not be able to do much for themselves anymore. Um, and, and usually in the middle and late stages is where you see these dementia related behaviors. Uh, and these are behaviors that your, your loved one might exhibit due to the cognitive decline that they're uh, experiencing in the brain. The brain is literally changing. Uh, neuron cells in the brain are, are dying and they're not communicating uh, with each other. And so that is what causes a lot of these dementia-related symptoms that you see here on the slide. You know, anxiety, uh, sometimes aggression, uh, agitation, changes in mood, confusion, judgment, um, repetition, refusal. Oh, I, I repeated a few of these bullets on this slide. I apologize. I, I need to do a better job on my, uh, my editing. But, but you can see that there's so many dementia-related behaviors that someone might exhibit. And everyone with dementia is going to have a, a, a unique experience. There's this saying in our field that if you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person because it is so unique to them. And so your loved one might experience a couple of these. They might experience all of these. But uh, as a caregiver, it's helpful to kind of know what, what could be so that you can prepare yourself on how you would react or how you would support your loved one through these various dementia-related behaviors. And a lot of times, uh, I like to think of it as uh, the individual trying to communicate something. Uh, if they're agitated or they're anxious, it's likely that they're trying to communicate something to you. And as a caregiver, uh, someone that's supporting a person living with dementia, it might be that they have an unmet need that they're trying to express. My colleague, Molly Carpenter, wrote a great book, Confidence to Care. And in her book, she has these kind of quick checks of unmet needs. So if your loved one is having a dementia-related behavior or they're trying to communicate or express something to you, you can kind of put on your detective's hat to try to get to the bottom of it. You can check in with their emotional state. Are they tired? Are they sad? Are they frustrated? You can check in socially. You know, are they feeling left out? Are they bored? Oftentimes, if an individual is bored, that's when we'll start to see some dementia-related behaviors taking place. Can you engage them in a meaningful activity? Is it physical? Are they hot or cold? Are they in pain? Do they need something to drink or eat? Uh, do they have to go to the bathroom? They just might not be able to meet those needs on their own any longer, and they need you to help. Or is it environmental? Uh, you know, as somebody progresses through the disease, uh, being in a crowded area, having a lot of things happening, you know, noise, uh, motion, that might be overstimulating. So maybe you need to remove the person from the environment 
or remove something from the environment in order to uh, help calm that individual down. So again, you can kind of check in in these categories to see, is my loved one expressing an unmet need? And some additional tips. Uh, for caring for someone living with dementia. You know, be present in that person's reality. Uh, oftentimes, your loved one might say or do something that uh, you know uh, isn't rooted in reality, uh, a delusion or a hallucination. They might think that, um, you know, they live on the family farm still. And uh, so it might be okay to just kind of go with it. And you, you don't have to feed into the situation, but you could say, oh, I remember the family farm. What did you love best about it? Don't try to kind of correct them or argue with them. That's going to get you nowhere and it's going to lead everyone to a more frustrating situation. Uh, and you can use the person's life story to really provide a personal care experience for them. So if you know that they grew up on a family farm, they love animals, how could you use that knowledge to create a meaningful activity? Maybe you go to a dog park uh, and you sit there and you watch all the dogs play, or maybe you go for a drive past some of the farms uh, outside of the city that you live in and you just kind of take in the sights and the smells. Also complimenting the person uh, sometimes is, is helpful. You know, as a person progresses through the disease, they're often losing a lot of independence uh, and it can be uh, a time where you're, you know, self-conscious and uh, you're, you're afraid or uh, you uh, are fearful of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. So complimenting the person saying, you know, you look really handsome today or, you know, you did a great job helping me set the table. That was so helpful. Thank you. Giving compliments, uh, giving gratitude can really go a long way. And you might find yourself in some situations where uh, there's an incontinence issue or your loved one says something that um, is inappropriate in that circumstance. Try not to uh, embarrass the person. Again, try to, try to put yourself in their shoes. Their brain isn't firing like a, a, like a normal brain. It's being impacted by dementia. So uh, try not to embarrass the person. Uh, maybe you try to put it on you and say, oh, I, I spilled something on your pants. Uh, let's go get them changed. I'm so sorry. Instead of you know, pointing out the fact that they just had an accident. Uh, those kinds of approaches can really go a long way uh, in making sure that the, the situation is addressed, but doing in a way that there's dignity and respect. We also want to set the person up for success when they're doing any sort of activity. So uh, that might be, you know, doing the task alongside someone. It might be uh, kind of breaking it down into simple steps, making sure they have everything that they need for that task at the ready so that you don't have to pause and, you know, go get the toothbrush. Okay, where's the toothpaste? Ah, I can't find it. You know, make sure they have all of those things that they need uh, for those simple tasks before they get started. So hopefully it can prevent any frustration. I have some more tips here. Uh, giving simple choices, especially when it comes to like a meal time or uh, a dressing situation, you know, instead of saying, what do you want for breakfast? Well, if somebody has cognitive decline, that might be a, a very overwhelming question. But if you say, would you like toast or cereal? Uh, that narrows it down. It empowers them with choice. Uh, but again, it doesn't make it so overwhelming. And oftentimes visual cues can be helpful. So you can even get out the bread and get out uh, the cereal and show them the options as well. Uh, sometimes it's easier to just take the blame and apologize for something, even if you know it wasn't your fault. Sometimes this is easier to set than done because we kind of have a natural tendency to uh, correct people if they're wrong um, or to set the story straight. But in some cases, you might just need to apologize. Then um, often redirecting someone's attention to an activity that they enjoy or uh, to a different topic can be helpful. And this works in a lot of different scenarios. So that's why it's important to get to know the person. You know, what are their likes? What are their favorite hobbies? What are their favorite topics? What's their favorite song? Um, you know, sometimes just turning on their favorite song and redirecting them to that can really diffuse uh, some anxiety and frustration uh, for everyone involved in the care situation. I mentioned earlier, sometimes you just have to remove the person or something from the environment. Uh, sometimes you have to break down the instructions and give instructions uh, one task at a time. Uh, instead of saying, okay, we're going to bake cookies. 
that's overwhelming, even to me. Uh, I'm not the best baker. Um, but, you know, if you break it down, okay, let's find the sugar. Uh, okay, let's get out the mixing bowl. Okay, let's pour the sugar in this cup. Okay, let's dump the cup into the bowl. Even, I know that's a really simple example, but giving those, uh, simplifying the task, giving those instructions one by one, and again, empower the person to do it on their own uh, and doing it in a way that's manageable uh, for them. I talked about meaningful engagement, um, and that's something that we really do well at home instead. Our, our professional caregivers uh, really look for ways to engage their clients in meaningful activities. And that's not just doing, um, you know, bingo or a crossword puzzle or, um, you know, playing a game for the sake of doing it, but it's because the person enjoys it. So getting to know the person based on their life story, providing activities, if you know that they were a gardener, uh, how can you find ways, maybe they can't plant a whole garden, but they can tend to pots, creating a, a couple of beautiful pots that they can put on the windowsill or the back porch, finding ways that they can still engage in those things that bring meaning and purpose to them, but doing it in a way that's modified um, to their, their um, kind of activity level, at wherever they're at in the disease process. Uh, and sometimes people overthink it. They feel like they have to plan an activity for every moment of every day. But you can think of, you know, everyday tasks as activities. Um, you know, you might feel like uh, uh, I'm doing laundry and if I ask them to help, uh, that's not a meaningful activity. But it's asking them for help, to help have them help you do something. And oftentimes we as humans, we have a need to contribute to society. We want purpose. We want meaning in life. And so if you can kind of unlock what gives that per person purpose, um, then, then those types of everyday activities are meaningful. Um, there's one example, this woman, she, she was a housewife and she always you know, had dinner on the table um, and was the one that uh, did all the cooking. And so for her, setting the table was really meaningful. You know, it was something she's done her whole life and she could continue to do even with dementia. And then think of it from like the five senses, you know, your, your, what can you do that engages their, their sight and their sense of hearing and their sense of taste and their sense of smell. This is especially helpful towards the later stage of, of Alzheimer's when the person has lost their ability to communicate. Um, you can still engage their five senses uh, and, you know, stir memories or to provide comfort. And they might not be able to express that uh, or communicate that it is meaningful, but often you'll see it in their body language. I think um, there's a famous quote that says, uh, you might not remember what a person did for you, but you'll always remember how they made you feel. Uh, one of the experts in this field, David Troxell, he always shares that quote, because when you're working with someone living with dementia, you're providing care for them, they are going to remember how you made them feel. They might not remember um, the details of it. So some final tips um, for, for the caregiver. I know I have provided tips on, you know, how to engage the person in meaningful activities, but you know, creating structure and routine can be reassuring to the person living with dementia. Also planning ahead uh, and not over scheduling can also be helpful. If you know there's a really important doctor's appointment, uh, try to clear everything else off the schedule that day and really just focus on that appointment. Give yourself enough time on the front and back ends to get that activity accomplished. And also be sensitive to the times of day your loved one is most alert. If you know, you know, the afternoon is a really hard time, they kind of get tired, they become really agitated, that is a time you probably want to limit visitors, you want to limit outings, and instead try to do those things at times of day when they are at their best. Um, and keeping a journal can be really helpful because often you can find patterns in your loved one's activity. Uh, whether that's uh, a dementia-related behavior, you might keep a journal of when that person's becoming agitated or aggressive. You know, what is the context? Uh, maybe there's something, or uh, maybe it's your approach that's not working. And so sometimes you have to look for those patterns uh, and adapt your caregiving style um, or your approach uh, to see if you can uh, maybe mitigate that dementia-related behavior or, um, again, just try to create uh, a more person-centered care environment. 
And then also look for ways for that person to maintain as much independence as possible. You know, it can be easy sometimes to do for someone, um, but a lot of times the person can do it themselves. It might just take them longer. And that's another thing I think our care professional caregivers do so beautifully is they are patient and they have the time to, um, you know, just help that person through an activity. Uh, and so you as a caregiver, you can do that for your loved one. It might take a little longer and it might not get done perfectly, but it empowers that person to do it themselves. And then some other um, just last minute tips for you as a caregiver, the best thing you can do is learn about the disease and how you can best um, you know, support your loved one living with dementia, especially as they progress through the various stages. Also maintain healthy habits for yourself. I know it's easier said than done as a caregiver to, to engage in self-care, but you need to care for yourself so you can continue to care for others. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the, the airplane example when you, you know, you're, they're going through the safety uh, protocol at the beginning. They say, secure your mask before helping others. That's the case in caregiving. Uh, you know, the care you provide is so vital to your loved one, but if you don't care for yourself, you're not going to be able to kind of maintain that care uh, and to care for your loved one. And in really sad situations, we see caregivers getting sick or passing away before their loved one. Um, and it really, um, it, it's hard to see that. So as, as a caregiver, if you can even take five minutes to engage in a little self-care each and every day, it's going to help you in the long haul. Because Caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease, it can be, uh, it can be a long journey for, for some people. Also find ways to manage your emotions. Go to a support group, um, you know, see a counselor. They make, because of the pandemic, counselors are more accessible than ever. Therapists, uh, you can do by phone or video chat. Um, also utilize your social networks. So often people in your social network will say, I'm here for you. Let me know how I can help. And as a caregiver, you're like, okay, that's great, but I have so much going on. I can't even begin to give you one task. That's overwhelming. But as a caregiver, if you can make a short list, keep it on your phone, keep it on the fridge of five things that people could do for you. So the next time somebody asks, you can say, actually, uh, the next time you go to the grocery store, if you could just bring over a gallon of milk, that would be helpful. Or check in with me to see what groceries I need. Uh, that would be wonderful. Or you know, Wednesdays are a super busy day. Could you bring dinner over on Wednesdays? That would be a huge help. Or I have a hair appointment every Monday at 4 p.m. And if you could just come be with my loved one while I go do that, that would be so helpful. Again, we have to sometimes be really specific in the ways that we um, uh, ask others for help. And you might think, again, it's just a small task. It's easier if I do it, even if it's 15 minutes. And if you're able to delegate four 15 minute activities, just think of that, the amount of time you would have left in your day. That's a whole extra hour almost of time that you would have to maybe engage in that self-care. I know it's easier said than done, but you just try to think through little ways that you can ask for help or, or find time away from the, from the caregiving, find that respite. Uh, you'll really be better off as a caregiver. And you know, providing a break is something we do all the time at Home Instead. We provide a break for families and we help kind of fill the gaps in care. So don't hesitate to reach out. And I did want to end uh, this, this portion of the live chat with just a few resources because Home Instead has some great resources and there's also great resources that a lot of our, our national partners have as well. So Home Instead has a help for Alzheimer's families.com website. Uh, I have a newsletter on there that you can sign up for. I host a monthly caregiver live chat, very similar to this actually. Uh, I just did one the other day um, and we talk about caregiving topics. Uh, we post those on our Remember for Alzheimer's Facebook page so you can like us and follow us. Um, and then the Alzheimer's Association, of course, has great resources. They have their website, the 24-hour helpline. And then for those who have a loved one with frontal temporal dementia or Lewy body dementia, there are specific associations that have support groups and resources for those specific disease states. So I do want to empower you with resources. There are people out there, uh, information out there that can help you and don't be afraid to ask for help. So Great. I know that was just like uh, <laughs> through a ton of information, drinking from a water or drinking from a fire hose, probably. <laughs> uh, but 
hopefully that was helpful to someone out there uh, and at least gave someone one or two more tools for their toolbox. Oh, I agree with you completely. I'm sitting here looking at myself, just shaking my head. Yes. The entire <laughs> time you were talking, it's like, oh my gosh. No, absolutely. I think this was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. I think kind of the takeaway for me really is what you're doing is you're trying to create an environment that maintains calm. Because if we think about it, we're dealing with individuals who are, uh, whether they can verbalize it or not, they're frustrated. I mean, imagine, uh, you know, imagine our frustration if we, when we break a, a limb and we're in a cast and trying to get around and do those things. I mean, that, that's a person with all, that's what a person with cognitive disease uh, is dealing with every day. They know something's wrong, but they just can't articulate it. And that frustration level is already here. And if we, you know, make a comment that is embarrassing, talking about uh, incontinence, or, you know, do something along those lines that, you know, could rub a nerve, you're going to Ex, you're going to create an aggressive individual or you're going to create an, a, a situation that needs to be de-escalated. Mm -hmm. So I love that all these tips really focus on bringing the calm into it and really treating that individual with dignity and respect. I've seen it in public settings where an individual who has cognitive decline is out with a family member and they're almost treating them like a child. And it's so disheartening because you know that that individual is may not, it may not connect with what they're saying, but the perception to the community is unfortunate so because we do need to treat uh, individuals with cognitive impairment with dignity and respect. And I think that is so well, important. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head with all of this. <laughs> it's just wonderful. Thank you well, so much. I, I think to just put a finer point on that, I mean, they were a person before they had dementia and exactly. they still are a person and they still have likes and dislikes and that need uh, for for community and connection and that need for purpose and um, meaning in life. And so mm -hmm. I think that that is really important for us all to remember. And as a caregiver, when you're in the throes of it, it can be easy to, you know, uh, get frustrated or uh, say something you don't mean. And, uh, you know, I think that, that back to that quote of they'll never, they might not remember what you said, but they'll remember how you make them feel. Like they feed off of your energy. Mm -hmm. uh, the person can, they can sense when you are tense. Uh, your nonverbal says almost just as much as your verbal, if not more. So just something to be mindful of. And, and again, I know that caregivers, when you're in it every single day, um, you might hear some of these tips and think, oh, if only it were that easy. Yeah. Um, but I think it, it is these reminders that help us to kind of reground ourselves and maybe give us a few new approaches. Uh, and you might find them to be successful. You might find some that don't work, but again, every situation is so unique. Oh, absolutely. I agree with that 100%. I think that um, self-care is so important. As a family caregiver myself, it's like, and my mother, who's a family caregiver for my 96-year-old grandmother, she doesn't even have cognitive impairment, but just the level of care that's required at her advanced age, it, it's, 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 uh, it takes a lot out of an individual. And making sure that you had to your point, what you were saying earlier about having those, those resources, those, uh, whether it be family and friends, whether it be reaching out to an organization like Home Instead for support, having that little bit of time, even if it's at 15 times four to get that 60 minutes out of it, it, we need to really be focused on the health and well-being of the caregiver, because as I remind my mother, and as you just said, you can't be a good caregiver for someone else if you aren't caring for yourself. Right. So I agree with that. I'd like to just switch gears really quick because yeah. we've, I've, and, and for those of you who may have been seeing me looking down here, it wasn't because I wasn't paying attention. It's because I'm trying to manage all the questions that are coming through the chat. So I wanna make sure that I get as many of those questions answered within the time that we have available. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with one of them that actually is a challenge for a lot of folks. And I think Lakeland, you may have a, a lot of great examples here is uh, this young lady is asking, how do I, I'm noticing that there is, my mom has memory loss and I'm concerned that it may be cognitive decline. How do I broach the subject with my mother without 
her getting upset? That's a really hard question, but a really important question and a good question. Um, you know, in this situation, I don't know if you've if you've tried asking your mom if she has any concerns about her memory. Um, you know, instead of going in saying, "Well, I've noticed that you're forgetting this, this, and this," you could kind of approach approach it more more softly and just saying, "You know, hey, mom, I I read an article. Make it up. I don't know. There's a lot of great articles out there that you can read." To say, I, you know, I was recently reading an article about you know cognitive impairment, and I was just curious. How do you feel about your cognition? Have you noticed any changes? Um, and, and kind of feel it out. Uh, see what her response is. Uh, and that way, hopefully, it's kind of more of a conversation. And uh, and hopefully, her, her defense doesn't go up right away. And even if it does, sometimes it just takes a few approaches to the conversation. Because she might, uh, she might be noticing things in her cognition, changes in her cognition that um, she's just kind of processing herself. Uh, and if you approach it maybe a couple times, maybe by the second or third time, she's had time to process it and maybe she'll be ready to talk then. But I know the Alzheimer's Association, they have some great resources on this topic on how to approach it. So if you just go to their website and, and search, you know, how to talk to my loved one about a diagnosis, they have some great tips. But you know, uh, that is, that's one approach. Or if you know that they have a doctor's appointment coming up, especially if they're uh, Medicare eligible, uh, now Medicare covers a cognitive screen at the annual Medicare wellness visit. So you could approach it from that perspective. You know, hey mom, I know you have a doctor's appointment coming up. Have, uh, I know that, you know, our brain is, you know, the command center of our whole bodies. Have you talked to your doctor about your brain health? I hear that, you know, Medicare covers cognitive, you know, um, evaluations. Have you thought about getting one, even just to have a baseline? Even if her cognitive, cognitive screening comes back like two thumbs up, even better, then you have a baseline to go from going forward. Yeah, that is wonderful. You know, I wasn't even aware of that. I think that yeah. that little piece of information right there is going to help a lot of folks because usually it does come down to the dollars and cents when it comes to healthcare. So knowing that that kind of uh, evaluation is covered is going to be a great resource for our, our viewers. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, I have another question. This one is, um, it, it, it's, yeah. I, I, mom was recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, she's currently experiencing what one would consider early stage. How long does mom have between middle and late stage? Oh, I wish I had a definitive answer for that question, but uh, it depends. And I hate to let, I hate to even say that because um, that is not probably a comforting answer to you, but it really does depend on her situation. I think the fact that she has been diagnosed earlier on is, is good because she probably can still contribute to a lot of the planning conversations. I mean, I've seen people live, you know, anywhere from two up to 25 years with dementia, with Alzheimer's disease. You know, those that only lived a couple of years, it's probably because they were diagnosed later in the disease process. Uh, and so they really didn't have much time to live. Others um, have, you know, found ways to engage in, uh, in, you know, a healthy lifestyle that can help kind of, um, I won't say slow the progression, but, uh, you know, they stay active, they stay engaged. Uh, so those are some things that you should consider with your, your mom is sit down and say, hey, I know we have this really tough diagnosis, but that doesn't mean life's over. Uh, let's talk through, you know, what you want this, this journey to be like. How can we as a family support you? There are early stage support groups. I know the uh, local Alzheimer's associations often have that where you can connect with others um, that are experiencing dementia symptoms that are diagnosed early. Um, and so you, you, get to, you get to choose your, your path. And some people, uh, a lot of the advocates in the space that I know have said, no, I could have gone one of two ways. I could have really wallowed uh, in self-pity. And, and, and that's, um, uh, I think, going through the, the emotions of dementia is so valid. And you should you know, go through those emotions and really feel them and, and not deny yourself of that. But those uh, individuals say, but I chose to, you know, you know, go through that, but then come out the other side where I chose 
advocacy and I chose uh, to connect with others and to still find purpose in meeting. Uh, I wanted to start painting, uh, trying something new, uh, those kind of bucket list things that I never got to before. But now I know, you know, my time might be limited and I want to make the most of it. So I would say, um, you know, keeping in regular contact with your your physician, your doctor is really important uh, to kind of walk through that journey with you. But uh, finding ways that your mom can still have purpose and meaning in life is really going to help her live life to the fullest, no matter how she progresses through the disease and how quickly. Thank you so much for that. I know that is a challenging conversation. Uh, it's, it's something that people have in mind, but again, they don't usually share that concern. So I'm thinking, and yes, it is a hard conversation to have because there are no clear cut answers to your yeah. point with uh, respect to, uh, you know, but we see that in other disease states with cancer and with, you know, other heart disease and things like that. There's really, again, it's all about catching it early and being able to go ahead and following your physician's instructions. Um, there's a couple of questions here on um, medication, but again, I, I don't know how comfortable you are having conversations about some of the medications that are being utilized for Alzheimer's. Uh, I, I, even as a pharmaceutical scientist, have questions on these things as well, but um, I'll, I, I don't know. Do you want to do you feel comfortable well, with just approaching that question? Yeah. Oh, I'll see. We'll see. I think you probably know more than I do on this topic, but medication, it is a challenging topic when it comes to Alzheimer's, um, but I'll let you go ahead and ask the question. We'll see. We'll so see. I guess one of the questions was, uh, it's basically about the Biogen drug. I think it's uh, Aldu, Alduhelm. Uh, yeah. that just came out, the monoclonal antibody, and if that is something that they should be advocating for their loved one to be taking. You know, that's a really great question, and this is a controversial drug, I will say that, uh, and there's a lot of information out there from both sides, and I actually just had a conversation with an individual from, from LEAD Coalition. They're one of the national kind of grassroots advocacy organizations on Alzheimer's disease. And he, I think, explained it really eloquently. Um, you know, this drug is not right for everyone. It's really for a very narrow group of people that have MCI um, or early on or early stage dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. So you really have to work with your physician to see if one, you even qualify for that very narrow group that this drug could be effective for. Um, you know, I think one of the you kind of have to weigh the positive and negatives. You know, this does not cure the disease. It does not uh, stop uh, um, the reverse the the. Um, reverse the disease, your loved one won't go back to a completely healthy state, but it, it could help to slow the progression. Uh, and so, uh, and there are some side effects that could be involved. Uh, and then there's also a substantial cost. And right now, you know, Medicare is trying to figure out how much they cover, if they're going to cover this. Often there's a copay involved. So from a financial perspective, you as a family also have to decide if this drug is right for you. I think that you know, the science in this field uh, in terms of pharmaceuticals has been pretty stagnant. There hasn't been a new Alzheimer's drug in a really long time. So that gives me hope. But again, you have to um, you have to educate yourself and really talk with your uh, physician about whether or not this is right for you. Uh, and then on kind of a, an individual basis, look at like, all the factors, the financial, the risks, the side effects, and all of that. So I wish I had a more clear-cut answer, but uh, that's I, kind of what I know with the limited amount of information I have. And I think that that, that makes perfect sense. I mean, again, that tends to be uh, the, the financial portion is an issue right now that, and again, I have had conversations with individuals from the Alzheimer's Association about this, this particular drug as well. Uh, it is the first drug of its kind that is actually going after the amyloid plaques that are, you know, one of the uh, reasons why we're seeing this neuron issues that, we're, that occur with Alzheimer's. 
Uh, I mean, most other drugs for Alzheimer's are more focused on symptoms and treating yeah. symptoms and not actually at the root cause. So there is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of hype about that from a, uh, from the scientific perspective, but what it, uh, and to your point, yeah, there isn't a lot, it, it is limited use for particular populations, but what it does from a pharmaceutical science perspective is give us hope that there will be a next generation of this, this drug class that will ultimately get better results. I think right now, clinically speaking, the clinical trial data showed a very slight you know, efficacy component. Uh, but again, um, right now, what we're trying to do is at least be able to have a platform in which we can proceed forward with. So I think that there is hope there and the research it continues. And I think that yeah. to your point, it has been stagnant, but I think that there has been a call from several different organizations, Alzheimer's being one of them, but there also seems to be an elevated um, concern from a, from a government standpoint that, you know, Alzheimer's is, you know, one of those, uh, Situ is one of those disease states that you know is creeping up there as one of the you know the top ten causes of death in in the country. I'm not sure exactly where it falls, but it's getting up there. Six. It's six number six. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I I I think that there's a lot of great research and science being done, and I think that you know it's been a while since something's come to market for the public that's been approved by the FDA, and I think you're right. This does give us hope, um, but is it the perfect solution? No, and I think that there will be, but it'll be hopefully the gateway to helping other drugs um, uh, get to to public uh, use, and and I'm hopeful. It gives me hope. Absolutely, I'm I'm completely on in the same same lane as you are. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's do a couple of more here because we do have a few more minutes. I believe we'll okay. close the hour uh, and go from there. So. Uh, Let's see here. Here's more of a practical a question. How do you deal with someone with Alzheimer's who doesn't want to shower? I had a feeling that was the question you were going to ask because this is one that I get asked all the time. Uh, I actually just created a great tips video um, that debuted on World Alzheimer's Day or that will be debuting then. Um, and it is all about this topic because this is a common challenge. So um, there's Without knowing all the specifics of this person's situation, I'll just kind of talk in generalities about the bath time showering routine. So there's some things to consider. Um, you know, showering for someone living with, well, for anyone, is a personal experience. Uh, so privacy might be why your loved one's resistant. And there's some things that you can do to create more privacy uh, in, in the bathroom, uh, in the bathroom experience. So, you know, if you're getting them ready to shower, can you utilize a robe until they get right to the shower? Can you utilize towels and washcloths in strategic locations, like for a female, one around the neck that covers the chest, uh, one across the lap that covers the private part? You know, you might have a few more soggy towels at the end of, of the bathing experience, but if it's helping them feel more, um, uh, if it's, uh, being more of a dignity and respect um, component to, to the showering situation, then, then I say, try that. Uh, it could be that you know, getting into a traditional shower where the water comes down might be intimidating. You know, maybe the person has sensitive skin. Uh, maybe they can't really express the hot or cold or the, or the shower pressures too much. Uh, so you might look into like the handheld shower. A lot of uh, Home Depot's, Lowe's types of places, you can get a pretty inexpensive um, shower head that you can replace. So, you know, you can take it off the wall and control where the water goes. So then you can make sure that you, you, um, you know, you shower them below the neck or approach from the behind the head instead of, you know, directly in front of the person. That could be what makes it an unpleasant experience. And you might also try making the environment more inviting. Like, do they have a favorite Scent? Is it like lavender or rose? Could you light a candle uh, in the bathroom? Could you put on their favorite song uh, and kind of get their mind off of the activity? Um, could you, you know, warm up the towels to make it nice and cozy? You know, kind of think through again those buckets I talked through earlier. Is it uh, kind of a, an emotional uh, thing that they're experiencing? Is something in the physical environment um, uh, upsetting them? Is it kind of a physical thing like too hot or too cold or the water pressure? So there might be some things you want 
to try. And again, that's why journaling helps or kind of keeping track of, okay, I tried this approach and it didn't work. So maybe I can try something else. But those are just a couple of the tips that I know have worked for our professional caregivers in various situations and, and that I've heard from families have worked over time. Um, and I know on homeinstead.com slash care dash resources, uh, those tips videos will be made available if they're not already. So you can go there to check those out. Excellent. Excellent. And actually, you know, that tactile experience is really important. Uh, one, especially from an individual with cognitive uh, decline, there may be some challenges with how one experiences a tactile event. And that actually kind of leads me into the next question, which is why does my mother keep scratching at her skin all the time? You know, that's a, that's a great a uh, great question. And again, it's, it's very individualized. So, you know, could it be, you know, as we age, our skin thins uh, and it's dry. So, you know, have you tried, you know, moisturizing your loved one after they bathe or shower? And you can kind of use it as an activity. Uh, we all kind of like a massage. So, you know, kind of, you know, take some time. Maybe you get a good smelling one and you kind of maybe put on some music and uh, rub the lotion on. That could be one of the reasons uh, it could be, is she, is she bored? Um, it could be that she needs more meaningful activity throughout her day. And, you know, sometimes when, when I'm bored, I find myself playing with my hair and those kinds of things. So, uh, you know, sometimes we think, you know, the person has dementia, so that's why they're wandering. And that's why they're doing this. And I'm like, well, we all wander when we're bored or we need to release some nervous energy. I go for a walk. That's how I, you know, um, release some stress. So, some of the things that your loved one is doing it might uh, be that there, there's that underlying kind of reason or that need uh, often behind it. So um, it could be that you need to try just a few different things. Um, and again, some of it might work and it might work for a couple of weeks and then it might not work after that anymore. You might need to kind of adjust your approach, but I would try to figure out, you know, um, is there something causing it? Maybe there is a skin rash or irritation. Have you been to the doctor um, mm -hmm. to have her skin assessed? Uh, maybe there is something medical happening. So those are some of the, the thoughts off the top of my head, but that's a, that is a tough situation. I hope that those are helpful. I, I, I think those are great, uh, great pieces of advice. We have time for just about two more questions and then we'll okay. go ahead and end the, uh, kind of go into our conclusion here. Um, one of the questions here is, uh, how do I calm down a loved one who gets aggressive when he forgets things? My father can get frustrated very easily. Mm. That is challenging, especially, you know, aggression and agitation can be one uh, very frustrating and um, at times kind of scary uh, dementia related behaviors. Uh, and so I would try to track track patterns. It sounds like when uh, this individual is forgetting things that they're getting upset and agitated. So I would look at, you know, what kinds of things are they forgetting? Is it like aspects of their daily routine? Okay. If, if it's that, how can you be proactive as a caregiver to try to get ahead of that? So maybe it's, he's getting really frustrated um, during his morning routine. You know, he's brushing his teeth, his hair, uh, combing his hair, that sort of thing. Make sure he has everything out uh, maybe you start to model the activities, uh, kind of talk him through step by step. Or maybe, um, you know, if he's forgetting the name of, of someone, you could, you know, kind of casually work it into the conversation in a way that helps him remember, uh, but um, hopefully reduces his, his agitation or, or aggression in those moments. Uh, and in times of, of, of aggression, um, you know, if you feel, you know, unsafe, um, sometimes uh, just leaving the room, or even even if you feel like, um, you know, you can just start to see them being aggressive. Sometimes leaving the room, especially if you're the person that they're upset with, leave the room, uh, wait a few minutes, you as a caregiver, just take a few deep breaths, and then come back in with a smile on your face, and a, hey, how are you doing? It's good to see you. And sometimes that little bit of a reset, uh, and again, you have to be aware of your of your loved one's cognitive status, but sometimes that reset uh, can be helpful in just kind of approaching it, stepping away, giving the person a little space uh, if they're safe in their environment can go a long way in kind of 
reducing that that aggression or agitation but that really is a tough one i have another video on that very topic so that same that same website i have some great tips videos that address a lot of these common questions because i do get these questions a lot so uh, for those out there that are asking you're not alone there are other families that are dealing with these same situations Oh yeah, I actually, it, that just brings to mind, that question brings to mind that movie with Anthony Hopkins, the father. That was yeah. an excellent uh, depiction of what life with uh, a cognitive impairment looks like or cognitive decline looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, last question for you is more on the nutrition side, which is okay. basically how important is nutrition for someone with Alzheimer's? Well, I feel like that is a big question to tackle because, um, you know, it, it really depends on the stage that your loved one uh, is in, in the disease, you know, early on in the disease, you know, nutrition is very important. I mean, continuing to eat a healthy diet, uh, we, we know that the mind diet or the Mediterranean diet has proven um, that it can help kind of reduce our risk for Alzheimer's disease throughout our life course. Uh, and so, you know, incorporating those kinds of diets towards, you know, those that are in early stage, it could help uh, to maybe um, reduce or slow the progression. We don't know that for sure. The science is still, um, you know, coming in on that topic, but I think it's still important because likely the individual is still very active uh, and they need those nutrients that we all do. Um, as someone progresses through the disease, uh, maybe they start to become uh, uh, more limited in what they will and won't eat, uh, and especially if they're in that late stage. I think as long as they're consuming calories, then you know it's okay. So it really depends on your loved one's situation. If you have concerns about nutrition, talk with their doctor and ask. You know, at this stage of the disease, um, how how much emphasis should I put on? on eating and nutrition, because, you know, if that's the thing that's causing dementia related behaviors, they're frustrated, they don't want to eat. Every time you try to get them to eat, they, you know, they get really anxious, uh, then, then maybe, um, maybe it's not as important. And if they only want to eat ice cream, then maybe they only want to eat ice cream and that's okay. And maybe you can try to find some a calorie or nutrient dense ice cream options. I think ensure they have like, I, I want to say they came out with, they have this, the little drinks, but I think I saw that they came out with an ice cream. Maybe I made that up, but I'm <laughs> sure there's an equivalent out there. Uh, and so I think, again, it really depends on your loved one's progression or point of progression in the disease. And then also talking with the doctor um, about, you know, what's best for your loved one at that point. Uh, that's, those are important. Excellent. Well, Lakeland, you know what? I really appreciate the opportunity to have you speak to our audience here. Um, your the information that you share today has, I'm sure, is going to make a difference in someone's life. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for for sharing your your knowledge and your expertise with our group here today. Um, so, with that, folks, uh, again, we'll have the. Chat will still remain open. I'll be able to answer any of those questions. Uh, I have to admit that our client care coordinators here at Home Instead utilize a lot of the tools that late, uh, Dr. Hogan uh, has presented. And we wanna make sure that uh, you're aware that uh, you know when working with, our, with Home Instead, that these teachings that Dr. Hogan has provided are available to our care staff as part of their standard training for um, working with individuals with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. So with that said, I'd like to thank you again for uh, taking some time to, uh, part to join us in this wonderful conversation that we had. Uh, again, Dr. Greg Sanchez, owner of Home Instead here in Pasadena and Monrovia. The Pasadena phone number is 626. Uh, 486-0800, and the Monrovia number is 626-599-2310. If you have any questions related to Alzheimer's and dementia or other challenges that you may be experiencing with, your, with the support and care of your aging loved one, feel free to give us a call. Thanks again. Take care now. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.